played? I don't think so, no. no. But I'm sure that sometime in the 90 minutes, when they're leading, like, maybe 2-0, Robbins will come on. He will definitely come on during the game. There's no doubt about that. I wouldn't think he'd start it. Because Wembley, it is a, a tremendous experience to come here. And, you know, you've got to be... Uh, well, sometimes an experienced professor because the roar and everything, and you could freeze. And I, I think Robbins, a young lad, he's done terrific well. He's a good goal scorer, but I would think that see, he won't start the game, but he will come on in the 90 minutes. Mm. Now, when you well, uh, uh, Desmond, who do you fancy? I mean, it's always the. the uh, Shall I be honest? One, yes, I shouldn't say because I'm supposed to be impartial, but I really think United will win today. Oh, thank you, thank yeah, you. So it's a Palace. Palace victory. You you are a shrewd judge on football. But there we are. Um, when you won the cup in in '63, what happened the following season? You had a pretty good run well, in the league, didn't you? Well, what happened? I mean, in '63, and it's very similar to United's position at the moment. I mean, they had a sort of they've had a poor time in the league. Now, in '63, we nearly got relegated. I think it was the last game that we uh, actually escaped. We came down here against Leicester, who were the favourites, and we played. We turned it on that day, and we played superbly. I mean, when you got players like Charlton, and of course Johnny Giles played, David Hurd, Pat Crerand. Mm. It it's all just pre-best that George pre, wasn't it? Yes, yeah. pre, just pre a yeah. few months. Yeah, we won the cup, and then that gave us tremendous confidence. And then from then on, we just had away. sort of well, yeah. It was just that little thing. Now the same could be with United today. It's an Beat Palace thought. today, and then go on to win league after league. <laughs> you're no, always, it, could, yeah. it could be, couldn't it? The thing about you, Dennis, you're always so down and depressed. Well, it is. You? I mean, you, yeah. well, life is like that, isn't it? <laughs> it's good to see you. Thanks very much. Well, now, uh, let's get out and about because Barry Davis is meeting uh, some other influential people here today. Barry. Bobby Billy Wright has just said that, uh, he and his wife have just said that they'd like Manchester United to win because of you. Oh, well, that's, that's very nice. But they, they are nice people, aren't they? Well, I, I would like Manchester United to win as well, I must say. <laughs> it's no great surprise. I've got a feeling, Norma, I, I have this feeling I'm going to ask it, having seen Joy's outfit and now this well, lovely hat. Someone's already said that to me, and I said, well, this is our Ascot. Cup final days, the football's sure. Ascot, isn't it? Yeah, it's a good Special line. An occasion, yeah. Sure. yeah. Are they going to win, Bob? I hope so, I hope so. We had a tricky year, but the, a lot of fans have come down, and we want to do something just to finish off the season nicely for them. I hope, I hope that we can win. We've got the players. If we play well, we should be, we should win. I hope so. Anyway, although I, I have a great respect for Steve Coppel and his planning, so we have to watch that. Would you be able to enjoy it? No, no. <laughs> I've, I thought at the beginning of the week, I thought, well, I, I can't really get built up to this because I'd been, I've been very busy. But th this last two days, it's starting to get to me. It's starting to get to me, and. I can't enjoy it, no. I kick every ball today. Are you sitting next to his left foot or his right foot? Well, which one's the weakest? I'll decide that <laughs> when I sit down, but it's one or the other anyway. <laughs> but I hope you enjoy it anyway. Thank you okay. very much. Thank you. Mr and Mrs Charlton looking very well indeed. And the crowds are arriving now at Wembley for this first FA Cup final of the 90s, the first all-seater, all-seated uh, cup final. The capacity today down to 78,000. Frank McClintock, you should know a bit about cup finals. You've played in enough of them. Yes, I've played in seven. Fortunately enough, uh, six of them here and one into City's First Cup when it was a home and away basis. What do you think about this one? I think it's going to be a very intriguing tie. I think uh, on paper, Man United look obviously the more classy side. Uh, I feel as though they're getting a team a little bit together now. Webb's come back, Pallister started to play really well and on paper it should be a Man United final. But Crystal Palace's cup performances have been excellent. And the one against Liverpool was absolutely fantastic. They've got height and power and strength, a lot of team spirit. And I think they'll push Man United all the way. But I've got a feeling that Man United's extra, a little bit of class may just take the game for them. Now, I think we fancy a little Beethoven seventh, don't you? With some goals, of course.
really fighting for his cup medal. Could he score the winning goal now? No. Some smashing cup final goals there. I reckon Veers was about the best, you reckon, Dan? I think that might have been a bit of a fluke there. Fluke? <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm only joking, I'm only right. joking. That was a terrific game, wasn't it? It was a smashing final one. Great, great match, that particular one. Do you think we're in for some goals today, or do you think it'd be a tight? People are talking about one nils today. And... Well, they shouldn't be talking like that, should mm. they? You should be talking a bit more positive, as they say. I would hope that we see plenty of goals. I mean, I did say 2 nil, but I mean, it could be 3 1. Mm -hmm. Hopefully. Most important than anything, I think, I hope it's a smashing game. I hope it's uh, an attacking game. Uh, because uh, Crystal Palace have got, if right, I don't know if Wright's playing, but Bright, he's a very sharp lad. He looks uh, dangerous. The, he will be the danger for Man United. Would you start the match with, uh, with Wright today, despite those injuries he's had? I would definitely start the game. If, yeah. he's, any, uh, if he's any chance of playing, I would start him uh, right from the beginning. Uh, mm -hmm. Because if, if he sort of breaks down well, okay, you'll take him off. But uh, I would think to start him from the very beginning. It'll be uh, particularly interesting to observe the goalkeeper's performances here today, won't it? Well, Martin? of course, Bob Wilson's on my left here. He's not talking to me because he's obviously not mic'd up. But, uh, I mean, he quite like goalkeeper. To say later. I mean, what do goalkeepers know about the game, eh? I mean, they're watching between the two. I mean, they can't play, can they? <laughs> I mean, they can't, can they? Throw the ball out, let the forwards take the game, and Robson will be magnificent for United, coming through, Hughes in there, bang. But what are you, what's your, what's your view of, of, of Leighton? How do you rate him? He's Good had... Scottish goalkeeper, strong, powerful, dominant in the box. Why, why are you laughing? I'm not laughing. You at are all laughing. You make me laugh. You make me hey, laugh. Not by the subject. The viewer can't your, see you. It's just you, your face. That, oh, thanks very much. That's very <laughs> kind of you. Good, strong go, uh, Scottish goalkeeper. Okay. Well, the Manchester United team are, are leaving their hotel. We'll have those pictures for you in a moment or two. But uh, meantime, Barry Davis has got uh, one or two other guests for us to meet. Well, with me now, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, John Major, and the Chairman of Aston Villa, Doug Ellis. Uh, Mr. Major, your interest in football? Oh, well, it goes back a long way. I started uh, watching Chelsea, if it's safe to say that, here today with uh, Manchester United and Palace in the final when I was about seven. And I've uh, watched football ever since. I love it a great deal. Mr. Ellis, I imagine you might just be having a word with the president of the UEFA, Lennart Johansson, while you're here with Aston Villa finishing his runners-up in the league. Yes, I'm looking forward to, uh, to meeting Lennart Johansson because, after all, Aston Villa is the only certain club at this moment of time before the final takes place who will in fact enter into UEFA, subject, of course, to the behaviour of our fans in Sardinia and Italy in general. But I'm pleased to say that Colin Moynihan has done a damn good job. He's been over there and persuaded them 
to wait until after the uh, World Cup before they make a decision one way or the other. But hopefully, fingers crossed, our people, our supporters of England, behave themselves. And I'm sure John Major, my colleague, will endorse that view. Oh, I certainly do. If they behave as the crowd are behaving here today, there'll be no difficulty at all. It's a super scene. Absolutely splendid. As for the football action, who do you expect to win? Well, I'm not at all sure. I'd better be very careful. My wife uh, comes from Crystal Palace. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I think, therefore, you should vote for Crystal Palace, shouldn't you? Oh, well, I'm hoping for an extremely good game. I have a childhood affinity for Manchester United, too. When I was a small boy, they had a wonderful team. That smacks of being always the politician. Oh, well, it may, but it's also true. I mean, anyone who saw the days of Tommy Taylor and, and who saw Duncan Edwards play is bound to retain an affection for, uh, for Manchester United. Yes, that's certainly very true. What about we've you, just, Doug? We've just passed Bobby Charlton, haven't we? Um, oh, I, I have a great affection for Manchester United. And whilst I should be biased as a member of the management committee, I'm going to stick my neck out and say I think Manchester United will win it. Well, I hope you both enjoy the contest. I'm sure we will. Looking forward to it very much indeed. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Barry. Thank, Thank you. you very Thank much. You. Thank you. I think uh, Barry was going to ask the Chancellor of the Exchequer another question. They're probably about inflation, I don't know. Anyway, the, uh, uh, the coach, as I say, will be uh, looking at those pictures shortly. But um, now let's go racing once again to Linkfield. This time it's the Oaks Trial. Palace are setting forth for Wembley on their historic first trip here from their headquarters. You know, the boys smartly turned out, new suits all, double-breasted, as you can see. And the big question is whether Mr. Ian Wright will uh, start the match for Palace today. Team photograph before they uh, board the bus. Manchester United are already underway. Steve Koppel, we're, uh, we've got one or two problems with our heli telly. We uh, show you the pictures from the air, as you know, and uh, it's gone off to be mended for five minutes. It'll be back. Steve looking confident. The youngest ever cup final manager at 34 is only a boy. Look nicely uh, relaxed. Well, they've completed their road to Wembley, these two teams, Crystal Palace and Manchester United. It has, of course, been a long one, and there's been a great deal of skill along the way. Stumps are finally drawn. Weeks before the season of cucumber sandwiches comes to an end, the FA Cup draws lines the length and breadth of the country. Wembley, where the last two will converge, is still almost nine months away. 541 clubs, great and small, were accepted. We've been following two, one in the northeast at Annick, almost in sight of the Scottish border, the other at Falmouth in the extreme southwest, clubs who knew they wouldn't arrive, but nonetheless travelled hopefully. The North wasn't noticeably shaken by the advent of this season's competition. It's a part of the country that has known more stirring events in the past. Today, while well, Peter Lee is just one of the other clans who are going to visit us for a little bit of a confrontation on the, on the sports field this time. Whereas in the history, um, we used to borrow people's cattle and wives, etc., uh, in the community, which was uh, led to a lot of aggravation. Not this time, though. The young, who found the confrontation resistible, were not bad judges. It ended one all. Annick had to go to Peter Lee for the replay. There, the odd goal in three took them through to the first qualifying round.
on the road again to Ashington, where the Milburns and the Charltons grew up and refined their skills. In those days, it was a mining village. Now the pits are closed, but the football tradition endures. When you take a goal kick, lift it really. Sissy Charlton teaches the next generation the basics on which her sons Bobby and Jack were raised. Perhaps she should have been coaching Ashington's grown-ups too. Annick, in their yellow chain strip, brushed them aside, scoring five times without reply. The draw made the next round more difficult, away to Barrow, 20 years ago, a football league club. The local industry used to be shipbuilding. Now it's nuclear submarines and the town is doing nicely. It supports a team that has come to terms with non-league status and in fulfilling its cup and Vauxhall conference commitments has revised a few coaching theories. I've been here now three seasons and for the last two seasons and this one now, we have never had a training session together, never one. In that, we went to the semi-final of the trophy, went to the first round of the FA Cup. Uh, we won the league and we're in the conference league and we have never trained together for two seasons. Whatever the secret, it worked again. Leading scorer Colin Cowperthwaite, with more than 250 goals, was on target again as Barrow took Annick's place on the road to Wembley. And after a two-all draw with Whitley Bay, that meant a coast-to-coast -coast trip for the replay. On a wet October night, this was far from an outing to the seaside. And waiting for them in the Whitley Bay team was a man who knew about cups and medals, Kevin Todd, trophy maker and collector. He was the winner of an FA Cup medal in Finland, good enough to have played with the best here. Egan. This is Todd. And now, under lights that didn't flatter his contribution, Todd showed that he hadn't lost the finisher's polish. His goal helped Whitley Bay to a 3-1 victory. Barrow's consolation would come on an alternative road to Wembley, a place in this season's FA Trophy final. Meanwhile, the FA Cup trail went west again, to Southport, who dropped out of the Football League as recently as 1978. This was an occasion for the romantically inclined. If Whitley Bay could win this one, they would reach the first round proper for the first time ever. They did it with something to spare. Kevin Todd was again on the score sheet. Are you equipped to be giant killers? First round proper now, can you really go a couple of rounds? There's the answer. There's the answer. In the south, the Wembley Road began in Cornwall. Falmouth is the west country of tourist brochures. Temperate climate, relaxing atmosphere. In contrast, Falmouth Town FC is more in the proud, competitive image of manager Dave Wadd, a former Army PTI and Metropolitan Policeman. In the preliminary round, they played Torrington, opponents whose bark proved more vehement than their bite. After a one-all draw, Falmouth won the replay on their own ground 4-2, with a couple of goals from former Brentford player George Torrance. The reward was a local derby with St Blasey in the first qualifying round. This, too, needed a replay. It was at St Blasey where the home side's goalkeeper failed a fitness test. His deputy, Ian Morris, proved to be the game's outstanding player. Whereas a foolish rush to the touchline by Falmouth's goalkeeper let in Mark Damorell for the only goal of the game. Mark has gone on to play in the second division for Plymouth Argyle. But it was more than Dave Wadd could stand. By the end of the week, manager and club had parted company. St Blasey then stepped up in class for a tie at Weymouth, relegated a few months earlier from the Vauxhall Conference. In a bad-tempered encounter, St Blasey lost a central defender sent off and the game 
The second goal coming from Kevin Smith with virtually the last kick. One step nearer Wembley for Weymouth manager Jerry Gow, who'd been there as a player in Manchester City's final against Tottenham Hotspur. His next challenge were Exmouth, facing their fourth game in eight days. But their squad was interesting. It included a physical training instructor at the nearby school for Royal Marine Commandos. And there was Keith Sprague, a ladies' hairdresser whose gentle touch with comb and scissors was left behind on a Saturday afternoon. And is it right that you tend to fall foul of referees a bit more often than some? <laughs> yes, I would say I was unfortunate. A lot of people wouldn't. What do you get into trouble for? Um, usually fairly hard challenges. So you're not... Uh, quite as gentle a guy on no, the field as no. you are around the around I the think it's a, a Jekyll and Hyde character within me. Exmouth took a first half lead through Robbie Hook and even though there were some desperately weary legs scored a second goal to win most worthily. One more victory at home now to Farnborough would take Exmouth into the first round proper further than they'd ever been. It was nil-nil at half-time, but with a near gale at their backs in the second half, Farnborough took complete control. So the tide finally went out for the series of clubs who'd represented the south-west coast. On our twin trails to Wembley, it was Whitley Bay from Tyne and Weir and Farnborough Town from Hampshire who carried us into round one. Farnborough could go no further. They lost at home to Hereford United. Darren Peacock scored the only goal for the fourth division side. But Whitley Bay thundered on, but Scarborough, Chris Scott's header, decided the tie and deserved to. Another superb header gave Aylesbury United a share of the non-league glory. Glenn Donegal's goal dumped Southend United. Welling United's victory over their fourth division neighbours Gillingham, thanks to Mark Hone's goal, was their first against a football league team. Not many non-league clubs get as close to the FA Cup as Marine did. It was on view in the Anfield Trophy Room when their tie with Rochdale was switched to Liverpool's ground. Three and a half thousand spectators looked somewhat lost. By the end, so too did Marine. Now Ward steps over a tackle. Still Ward, oh he's got a player on the right. This is Rochdale's best moment, there's no doubt. There it is. Memories of Wembley 53 were stirred when Stan Mortensen and Nat Lofthouse led up Blackpool and Bolton at Bloomfield Road. And the game that followed echoed another name from that unforgettable final. And Matthew's in a good position here, number seven. What a bad pullback either. And Garner! Go! Round two, Whitley Bay versus Preston North End brought a 1954 finalist back to the cameras, Tom Finney, now the third division club's president. Whitley Bay weren't overawed by Preston past or Preston present. Robinson and Pearson hit the heels. Robinson, go! Whitley Bay have scored! It's Tony Dawson. Todd's made a very good run coming in from the far side. He could be found. Oh, and Pearson's there. And this is Todd! It's two! It's 2-0 two to Whitley Bay! Cattle country means Hereford, and that means Ronnie Radford and a goal against Newcastle that of its kind will never be surpassed. Radford again. Oh, what a goal! What a goal! That was 18 years ago. Now against Merthyr Tidwell, Paul Tester set off on a run that culminated in a goal of a different kind that will also stand the test of time. And so as the superstars prepared to join in, the roads that started at Falmouth and Annick had reached Hereford and Whitley Bay.
all the stars turned out to be so super. Coventry City, cup winners three years ago, knocked out last season by Sutton United, this time fell over Northampton Town. Steve Berry's goal brought them down. Fort Bale's...